Hi, I'm Ellie Wong. Welcome back to The Daily Brew, the podcast for the Stanford Daily and our Lines of Love series. Inspired by the New York Times Modern Love column and podcast, we're looking for all of your stories about love at Stanford. Tell us about your freshman dorm community, the pets you're reunited with in quarantine, or even that chocolate chip cookie at late night that you're missing right now. Whatever love means to you, we want to hear it. Today, staffers Lorenzo Del Rosario and Catherine Jung will be reading Christine DeLeon's article, Love and Other Misgivings. Afterwards, hear from the author about her process of writing the essay and her thoughts on the portrayal of love on screen. In December 2006, my mom fired grandma. She'd returned home from a night shift to find a human carousel in her living room, my two sisters chasing each other in circles, each holding a half-drink bottle of cranberry juice, while I, six years old, sat cross-legged at their circle center, watching Sex and the City on the television. Grandma snored on a lawn chair two feet away with the drooling Cosmo in one hand, the remote dangling in the other. When she woke hours later, she was out of a job and in the early stages of a hangover. I cried and cried and cried when Grandma left that morning. My mom crouched down in front of me and kissed my tears. Remember, she's not your real grandma. Turns out, grandmothers were fruitful pickings in Haitian circles, and the woman babysitting me and my sisters for the past eight months wasn't my mother's mother, who died long before I was born, but grandma number six. This grandma stood out from grandmas number one through five because of her ability to handle our abundance of energy. Whenever we'd get too rowdy, she'd sit us down, flip off the living room lights, fetch a VHS cassette tape from her purse, push it into the VCR, and then watch from a distance as the movie swept us into a world that had become my obsession, the world of romantic comedy. In this world, love was the cure to all ailments. Characters like Elle Woods, Patrick Verona, and Mia Thermopolis were my guides through a universe of love confessions, dashes through airports, and rain-soaked kisses. It was as if they told me that despite how anxious, bland, and incompetent I was, there'd be someone out there for me. From when Harry met Sally to she's the man, the same elements existed. A flawed protagonist, often with a case of fire mouth, trying to figure out life. A chance encounter with the protagonist's future romantic partner, also known as a meet cute The cast of supporting friends, who adore the protagonist and are on deck day in and day out to solve the protagonist's problems. Finally, the protagonist's grand epiphany, or declaration of love at the end of the film. You complete me. In the world of rom-coms, I experienced new cities, new friends, and new ways for me to fall in love in the span of two hours. And I fell, and I fell, and I fell. If I played my cards right, I'd have all of it and more in my world too. I met Vincent on the first day of fourth grade at my new Catholic school. The teacher sat us at the same table. I'd crack a joke, then say sorry. He told me not to apologize so much. Vincent wasn't my first crush, but he's the first one who, when I ogled at him from across the classroom, ogled back. I wasn't allowed to date then, so our friendship was all love-hate, defined by banter and playing Nintendo. One Monday afternoon, our class walked in a single file line from class to the on-site church for weekly prayer. Vincent and I clambered into a pew before the altar and cupped each other's hands. My body was energized by the touch of his palm as Father Jedrick's invocation washed us with words of divinity. Father said, Amen. Vincent yanked his hand away from mine and made a show of wiping his hands on his trousers. Too late, Vincenzo. There was a buzzing in my chest and heat flowing to my ears. I wouldn't wash my hands for days. It was official. I loved romance. I loved the way it stood out for my other relationships. I loved the way it formed a sacred connection between people. I loved the way it made me love life and think life could be better. Most protagonists have known their best friends since childhood, but I met Katie later in life. On Tuesday, October 15th, 2013, 6.45 a.m., the AC was on full blast as I entered the choir room for the first day of 8th grade at a local public school. I was late, two months or so, and went through the mandatory new kid introduction ritual. I, a black girl, stood silently beside the teacher before the curious crowd of white faces. Then I chose a seat on the bleachers, the one closest to the exit, and ended up sitting at the feet of the school's biggest chatterbox by random selection. I'm Katie. Why do you sing so quiet? Where do you live? Why'd you pick this school? It sucks. I declined invites to kick back at her place after the final bell. I wasn't looking for anything serious. 
Inevitably, I'd soon discover a new yellow flannel notice on my kitchen counter and be off to a new school, a new town, a new classroom. But thanks be to whomever needs to be thanked that she never got the hint. Although I insisted the only friendship I needed was with my sisters, Megan and Rachel, Kitty broke down my wall more each day. The jokes we cracked in the choir room never fell flat. Our weekend phone calls lasted hours, and the cherry on top was that we both agreed white supremacy stunk, which is a challenging core to strike with most middle schoolers. For a year, I tried to convince my mom to let me hang at her house. When she finally approved, the first item Katie and I checked off the bucket list was throwing a movie night in her bedroom. She suggested we put on 500 Days of Summer. I heard the ending was dreary, so I suggested Pretty Woman instead. As Julia Roberts and Richard Gere embraced on a New York City fire escape, Katie and I snuggled underneath the comforters, and she became the first person I said I love you to outside my family. Then in December 2016, during our junior year, Katie met Connor. Akin to Amada Romeo, he slid his bid for her affection into her Instagram DMs. What's the social studies homework? By January, they had exchanged I love yous, and Connor was a permanent member of our movie nights. I liked Connor. He was witty and fun and genuine in his care for Katie. As her best friend, I needed to be happy. None of the rom-com protagonist's best friends complained. I didn't mind when Katie stopped calling on the weekends or when Connor unexpectedly dropped in on our hangout sessions or when our conversation started to revolve around one point, him. The summer before college, I brought up my concern to Katie as we lounged on her bedroom floor. He's my boyfriend, she said, which I understood to mean he's my priority. Then she pressed me. When would I finally see the soft pink lights of romance? She wasn't the first to ask that. A few people have even accused me of being immune to love. But it wasn't long ago that I'd close the door to my bedroom, search kissing videos on YouTube, and practice smooching my future partner on my hand. I was meticulous. Make a fist, thumb over fingers, remember, this time no teeth. My lip muscles became extraordinarily strong, but I still had to put my skills to work. The closest I came was during my senior year when I attended a scholarship retreat in Rochester. I befriended an aspiring optometrist with whom I spent almost all of my time, but I didn't realize he was interested in me until the last day when he passed me an origami rose inked with his phone number. My immediate instinct was to flee. His flirting sparked in my fear of devotion like he expected me to cut off my arm and hand it to him. Once I returned home, I'd rarely respond to his texts, keeping it friendly when I did. Then one day he called me. When I picked up, he said, I know what you said. Confused, I asked for clarification. Apparently, I'd butt out him while talking to my sister. He turned me and described him to her as a friend I made at the treat. He sounded hurt. I told him that he was great. I just didn't want to date him, but... Don't say it, he said. I don't want to be just friends. One version of a classic genus of rom-com dialogue... The soundtrack comes on heavy as the protagonist runs through a crowd to their bay, grabs them by the hand, peers into their eyes, utters, I want to be more than friends. I bolted downstairs and dished what happened to Megan. She put down her copy of Saga, amazed, and said, Everyone treats relationships differently. People weigh their relationships differently, I thought. This wouldn't be an issue with my sisters. When I was 12, We created a system for who would get to be each other's maid of honor. Sister A is the maid of honor for Sister B, Sister B for Sister C, and Sister C for Sister A. As we got older, the obvious solution was for us to have two maids of honor, but the idea's sentiment remained true. There were no favorites among us. My mother is in a league of her own. We are the only love in her life. She's had a few friends over the years, but I've never seen a partner by her side. Once, she told me my dad was her soulmate, but he was also too ambitious for her own good. He booked it to medical school in Mexico. He stole the rent money for the month and left my mom pregnant and on her own with three kids. She said good riddance. If you're reading this and thinking, black? Poor? No father? God. Kindly put down these pages and pick up a Tyler Perry flick. There you'll find all the material you're seeking, packaged in a neat 90 minutes, ready for your consumption. I have no interest in roaming the hallways of my inner mind, digging through the files behind some forgotten door, rubbing puzzle pieces together to fill a man-sized hole in my heart because there is no hole. There are no daddy issues to be tackled, 
no daddy to search out. I'm not in the PI business. I'm in the love business. My mother's lack of romantic intimacy and my sheltered lifestyle meant it was rare for me to see the romantic displays of affection on TV in real life. The grandest gesture of romance I witnessed was at 13 years old when my sister Brittany broke up with her boyfriend, Timmy. Determined to win her back, he stopped by the house one afternoon and climbed the stairs of our backyard patio with something in his pocket. He gestured for me to get her attention through the glass door. He waited until my sister turned around to face the door, revealed a knife, and slid it into his stomach, then threw himself down the stairs. My sister told me to stop screaming and to call the ambulance as she rushed outside. As I grabbed the telephone, I blamed her in my mind for not distinguishing the good guys from the bad ones, and myself for buying into such dualistic thinking. I blamed him for hurting himself to manipulate her into staying with him. Where did he learn to do that anyway? Sierra and I properly met when my friend invited me to their weekly lunch date. Over an acai bowl, she recounted her summer spent hooking up with the girls. Of course, it didn't turn into anything, she added slyly. Sierra appeared sculpted from obsidian rock, dark glassy skin, nose wide, hair kinky. As she spoke, I ached to grab her and break the news. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know the rules? We're at the bottom. But the difference between me and her was that she didn't hide behind statistics. She was out there. I'd spent so much time rejecting and cutting off people that I wondered how many opportunities I'd overlooked. How many origami-making optometrists are out there? I remember the one time I confided in my sisters about my frustrations with Katie and Connor's consuming romance. Rachel sympathized with Katie. She said falling in love can be like a trip. It feels so good, and it's all-consuming. I argued that friends can feel good, too. You don't build a life with friends. You don't buy a house with friends, she said. You could if you wanted to. She rolled her eyes. You just won't understand until you're in a relationship. There, somewhere in the tiny corner of my brain, my mind left me, like someone had moved the VHS tape from the VCR and smashed it to the floor, the film reels pouring out. I thought back to our promise to be each other's maid of honor. In my mind, I'm clad in a pink suit beside my sister as she exchanges vows with her partner. As the minister announces them legally wed, the altar begins to tremble. I think it's an earthquake, but then the floor beneath the newlyweds breaks off and begins to levitate above us, their heads dipping down as they upon us. Everyone claps as they ascend to a place that's higher than God, higher than me. And my sister's beaming as she waves goodbye because she found someone that she felt she couldn't live without, her priority. I felt like one day I would be pressured to find a partner I couldn't live without. But what if I don't? What if my heart's saturated with love? There's the idea of romance that's performed via film, then there's the romance which exists between two real people. Romance and friendship don't operate in the binary, but I was still crushed by the fear that anything could surpass the love I have for those already in my life. I'd rather be caught in limbo than find out I'm the type of person romance made me out to be, especially when I could lose it. Last week, I video called Katie to congratulate her on her four-year anniversary with Connor. I don't know why, but after I hung up, I opened a tab on my computer and typed Vincent's name in the search engine. This isn't the first time I've googled him, but it's usually a dead end. I scrolled through Facebook and wondered what a reunion would look like between us. Vincent, I'd say warmly smiling as he entered the coffee shop. I missed you. He'd sit across the table. He'd straighten his spine. I missed you too. He'd comment on my appearance, how much I'd changed. My ears would grow hot. Things change, I'd say. Remember how much fun we had back then? His eyes would soften as he looked at me. I'd feel comfortable enough to admit to him. I compared every single guy I've met to you and the way you made me feel. He'd want to know. Why didn't I call him all those years ago? Why call now? I'd take a moment to think. I've missed lots of opportunities in my life. I guess I'm just haunted by all that potential energy. He'd nod. A moment would pass. Then he'd reach across the... Facebook updated its result page. There was a profile that wasn't there before, with a picture of a boy. He had a square face. It looked like him. At least, I thought it did. I stared at the profile. Maybe it wasn't him. Even if it was, I probably wouldn't recognize him.
Christine is a junior at Stanford, and she is from Long Island, New York. This piece, Love and Other Misgivings, was written for her spring quarter class, English 91, Creative Nonfiction. First two weeks between like spring break and the start of like spring classes on my couch, just like watching like a rom-com, like watching like Isn't It Romantic like six times in a row, feeling like this sense of loss, opportunity. I was assigned like a warm-up. I just ended up writing about that experience and my teacher in one of the comments, he was like, oh, you seem pretty bitter, like pretty reluctant to love. I was like, me? She also mentioned the need to broaden the types of relationships represented in TV. You have like your friends, then you have your lovers or like people you're interested in, right? And we spend more time exploring romances than we do friends, at least on like TV. And I think that also the type of relationships, we're doing better recently in terms of diversity, but oftentimes they're like heteronormative, this pressure to find someone or as if I'm something wrong. And like, especially like when it comes to women, we sort of just like, you know, disappear after age 30 on like, or like age 40 on TV. So I think that we do need to diversify the real types of relationships we see, whether that's just like, you know, like more nuanced or complex friendships and more nuanced and complex, like romantic relationships. Since writing this piece, Christine has changed her perspective on relationships. It's more about like finding like meaningful connections and not just idealizing what romantic relationships. Also just appreciating like people for who they are and not projecting what you want them to be onto them. Lines of Love and The Daily Brew are produced by The Stanford Daily. This episode was produced and narrated by Lorenzo Del Rosario and Katherine Jung. I'm Ellie Wong, the managing editor of Volume 258. If you have an idea for a podcast, visit stanforddaily.com slash join. We'll see you next time.